podcast. This is Ron Costa broadcasting live in the Mappable USA studios in Las Vegas, Nevada. And today, folks, we're going to take the subject back to one that we love dear to our hearts, the old Opportunity Zones. And for that, let's call in Vicki Hutchmala from the QOZ Marketplace. Vicki, are you there? I'm here, Ron. Doing great in Las Vegas. You know, this is the time of year that we live for in Vegas. We suffer through 120 degrees in the summer just so we can get to this time and spend six months of perfect weather. Exactly. People love to come. Yeah, people love to come to Vegas and visit Vegas this time. There's tons of conferences going on, of course, because this is the greatest time of the year. We've been to a number of them. We've been to a lot of them at the Opportunity Zones as well. And That's one true. in particular, we're, we're going to bring on a, a, a guest uh, a, that, that deals in Opportunity Zone Consulting as well. So, so let's let's bring in uh, Edmund Rakiti from the Op Zone Consulting. He's a co-principal of that company. Edmund, how are you doing today? Doing great, Ron. Thank you. How are you doing, Vicky? All right. Excellent, excellent. Looking forward to the podcast, Ed. Likewise, thank you. Yeah, so uh, so Edmund, you know, we we looked at your website. We know what you're doing in the in the marketplace there. You're very active in what's going on. Why don't you tell our audience a little bit about yourself, your background, and kind of how you started getting interested in the in the Opportunity Zones marketplace? Absolutely. So uh, I actually have a background in hospitality. Uh, When I moved to the States, my family owned a restaurant here in Clearwater, Florida. So I grew up in the restaurant business. From there, actually transitioned to uh, running grocery stores for uh, Aldi Grocers. Uh, Did that for about five years before I jumped into uh, wealth management. I've been doing that for the past uh, seven or eight years. And then when uh, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act came out, really did my homework and due diligence on the program, and it just clicked just said, uh, hey, this this program is going to change communities, uh, and I wanted to be a part of that. That's great. So then you you started the, the, the you co-founded this company or and and got this thing going. And and uh, what what do you what do you think right now is one of the major uh, points that everyone needs to know about opportunity zones in general? I think the the biggest thing people should really be looking out for is the projects that they're investing and and really doing their due diligence and homework uh, on those projects, the proper underwriting, the right founders. Uh, As you know, there's a lot of funds out there, a lot of different projects, and, you know, just want people to make sure they're they're putting their hard-earned money uh, into solid projects. People think that it's so easy to get into an opportunity zone, which it is. You self-certify yourself, your fund with the IRS, and there you go. But they don't understand that there's a whole gamut of work that you have to do, of homework that you have to do to make sure that even though you want to invest in opportunity zone, as we, as Ron and I have discovered, not all opportunity zones are created equal. Just because you live in uh, Ohio doesn't mean that you should put your fund in a property in an opportunity zone in Ohio. Maybe it's better to invest in New York or or here in Vegas because it's a better location. And if you don't understand that concept, it doesn't matter when you go down the road. You're never going to get a deferment in capital gains because your project's never going to be successful. Do you agree with that? One hundred percent. And, you know, you hear this all the time. The, the projects have to pencil out on paper before you even throw the, the incentives on there. Uh, and, and you see that a lot. Individuals just saying, hey, have a project in the op zones. I think it's going to be great with the deferral. And when you really put pen to paper, it, it, it doesn't pencil out at all. So, you know, we just want to caution people of that and, and make sure what you're getting into, not only from a, a project perspective, um, but make sure the team that you're engaging with is competent and will keep the fund in compliance and has, has the right partners on their side to make that happen. Exactly, because it's not just the fund, the managers of the fund making sure the fund operates according to all the rules and regulations so you don't become decertified down the road. But in addition to that, you have to really do your homework about the developers and the project managers of the actual development to make sure that they also have a history of success in in whatever other projects, be they an opportunity 
community zones or otherwise, that they have a, a track record that you can follow, that they can pro, uh, complete the work, make it successful, not just for today or not just for the day that the, the project is complete, but in five years, what's it going to look like? Is it still going to be booming? Are you actually going to make any money to defer capital gains on in 10 years? That's an equally important part. A absolutely agree, Vicki. And we've, we've been pretty lucky in the, the Florida region mm -hmm. here. We've got a great group of developers. The downtown Tampa area is absolutely booming. So we've been able to position ourselves alongside of a lot of great uh, developers in their uh, specific asset classes and just say, hey, here's, here's the projects we want to undertake. You're best in class in that space. You know, we, we'd love to bring you on and, and help you through this process. So absolutely agree with that. Do you, are your are the opportunity zones that you're working with are they primarily in Florida? So as of right now, yes, um, most of the projects are in Florida. Other than the self storage fund, we are looking at tertiary markets in the northeast and the southeast. Um, but the the largest project that we're working on is in Central Florida, and the entire county has been designated an opportunity zone. Uh, oh, and it's wow. a really, yeah, if, if you look at the map uh, and look at Central Florida, you'll see a gigantic uh, blue block in Central Florida. It actually makes up two counties. Um, so that's one of the projects. They're in a very unique situation, though. They happen to be uh, on a riverfront that leads out to a lake, and they have a commercial airport nine miles south that will be handling a lot of incoming traffic that, uh, you know, will really help boost that, uh, boost that local economy and bring jobs. And as you know, to keep those jobs there and to keep those individuals there, we, we need proper housing and we need places for them to eat and play. So what kind of uh, projects are you working on? Are you primarily in the residential aspect or are you also doing business development? So we, we are attacking everything. So, uh, another great example of a concept we're trying to bring is a company uh, from overseas, actually, that takes reusable plastics and uses them for asphalt. So an eco-friendly asphalt that happens to be, uh, you know, a lot more sustainable and also durable. Uh, so we are engaged on both sides. Um, that Central Florida project specifically, it will have every asset class in there. So from hospitality to multi-family, mixed-use, uh, and some boutique hotels. And, again, we wouldn't be able to do that without the proper developer partners on our side. Well, and, and not only that, but the whole concept of the Opportunity Zone program is to elevate depressed areas where these zones are located. So you have to, whatever project you undertake, needs to be able to support the community in different aspects. If, you, if you're if you going to build a multifamily residential, what are they going to do, the people who move there? Are there jobs? And, and if you create a business uh, environment in an opportunity zone, that's going to bring people in. So are there stores or are there markets or are, are there banks and, and airports and infrastructure to support what you're doing becomes, the whole thing becomes kind of symbiotic, which really is the purpose of the program in the first place. Absolutely. C couldn't agree more. Uh, and I actually heard a, uh, a wonderful phrase at the Southeast Region uh, Opportunity Zone Expo over the past couple of days, uh, and that was, why are you awesome today, and why are you going to be awesome in 10 years? And that exactly. really fits into what is that community doing to bring in jobs, to keep the individuals there, to make sure that there's affordable housing, workforce housing, and places for them to, you know, take the family out and have the dinner or, or go grab a coffee. Uh, so everything really does work in conjunction when you're looking at, uh, you know, not just a, a large-scale project like the one we're looking at there, but even when you're looking to put in a, a single, you know, multifamily project in a town, what's surrounding it to make sure that it's going to be sustainable? 
Exactly. And, and also, are the people, are there people that can afford to move into your uh, multifamily residence? Will they be able to afford the rent today and still be there in six months? And are they going to stay in the area or do they have to go 10 miles away just to go grocery shopping because there's no, no market around? Those, these are all considerations that people have to consider when they invest or create a fund or a project in an opportunity zone. And the, the, the thing that's at the bottom of the list of consideration is the capital gains deferral, the capital gains benefit, because that's not the focus of an opportunity zone project. That's just basically the icing on the cake. Absolutely. And it- I think that that risk is exasperated when you look at these rural areas around the U S you know, it's, it's a lot harder to get a project to pencil out in, you know, rural Florida than it is in downtown Atlanta. You know, so you, you definitely have to be conscious and cognizant of that when you're out there trying to get these projects done. Yeah. And a lot of this that we've just been talking about is really from a developer or for a fund perspective, but, but if you're an investor who is looking to, you know, put their capital gains into one of these opportunity zones. And maybe you just found out about it the other day. Maybe you listened to a podcast or read an article or whatever. Uh, Edwin, what do, you, what do you say to that person that really just, just, has just got an idea about it and doesn't know a thing about the project? Where does he start? Where does he start to get this due diligence process and the information he needs? Great question. So the first thing I would tell him to do is really look at the community where, where the project is going to be, you know, what has the community done in the past three to five years? What are their plans to grow that community, you know, over the next three, five, seven, ten 10 years? Um, I would say start there, then really dive into the project, you know, the, the fund sponsor, the developers. Um, I, I think those are obviously extremely important, but if the community that you're going into, you know, isn't getting, isn't giving that support from a, you know, local government level, uh, to really push ahead these projects and make sure that they succeed, I think you're, I think you're going to struggle. And I think Air EPA, uh, Pennsylvania, is a great example of this. Uh, you know, I, I believe they're the poorest zip code in the nation. And when the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act came out, that entire community rallied around the Opportunity Zone uh, legislation. And, you know, they've, they've gone full steam ahead, and now they're getting all sorts of you know, interest from other investors who are saying, hey, you know, this community is behind this program. That's somewhere where I feel safe putting my dollars, even with a medium household income under $11,000, I believe, in that area. Wow. Yeah. And that's huh. important yeah. because if, if the municipalities where you're putting your project aren't working with opportunity zone investors or developers, that will create a a major problem because it's time sensitive. You have to do things within certain periods of time. And if you have to take three years to get your project through the, the, uh, the zoning, the planning, the permitting, then you're going to go someplace else. So your, your municipalities have to be very involved creating incentives to bring you to them because, as I said earlier, all opportunity zones are competing with each other, and you've got to be the one you want to come to, like uh, Pennsylvania. Absolutely. And, you know, we've, we've had a chance to speak with a, a lot of the local governments, uh, especially here in, uh, in Clearwater where, where I live. And we tell them, you know, make it easy for people to do business in your community. Um, You know, I'm not saying, you know, just lay down and do whatever they want. But, you know, if individuals are coming with great projects and they want to revitalize your community, you know, don't make them wait two years on entitlements. As we all know, you know, developing inside the Opportunity Zone, uh, you know, program is is on a very short timeline, you know, 31 months to, to truly deploy your capital when we're talking about large, you know, large scale development is not a lot of time. Exactly. No, it's not. It's not. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Have you, have you worked with uh, Aaron Gillespie down in Florida? N- not yet, but I, I've heard Lauren speak a few times. Uh, and we actually spoke at the USF research and innovation center uh, on the same day. No. So, 
but I hear amazing things about Erin, and she was very well-spoken uh, when I heard her talk. Oh, yeah, she's fabulous. We've done a couple of podcasts with her, uh, and and she just is right on top of everything and I and can help anybody in Florida for sure bringing munici- working with municipalities and projects she's fabulous she really is and there's actually another really great group that uh, we're hoping to coordinate with here in St. Pete uh, and that's Eastman Equities and they've done an amazing job programming uh, downtown St. Petersburg uh, which is pretty unrecognizable now from what it was five to seven years ago and they were able to bring in that development, but still keep that hometown feel. You know, you right. don't just see a bunch of big chains or, or flag hotels. You truly see, uh, you know, the, those community businesses coming in there and, and thriving. Uh, so that's what we're hoping to do in the Central Florida Project. Um, and we're even in the early phases of trying to do that in the downtown Clearwater area. Uh, we're lucky enough to present in front of the city council for, for Clearwater at an expo that we did here and uh, just say, hey, if, if you make it easy for individuals to do business here, they'll bring good projects, you know, just, just let them work and, and let them do it. Um, Absolutely. Because that, 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 if you can't do it on time, you might as well just forget that whole location and, and not even, they're not even feasible. Agreed. Agreed. So, you know, Ron, going back to that, you know, original question, what should they look for is really that community. You know, what, what has city council done in those areas? You know, are, are they pro business? Are they pro growth? Do they want to see that, you know, do they want to see that happen and start there? Okay. Excellent. And when people come to you, like you're, you're a consulting company uh, in general, but what I like about what you guys are doing is you're also uh, multifaceted. You are, launching your own fund, aren't you? Your own Opportunity Zone fund? Correct. So for the Central Florida project and then also a self-storage fund, uh, we'll be launching those in conjunction with uh, a couple of our capital partners and uh, developer part, our development partners, uh, which is exciting. Um, with a large-scale project like the Central Florida one, as you know, with that short timeline, it's going to be really difficult for a single developer to come in and take down that entire project uh, so what we've done is really uh, went out there and we sought out, you know, best of class in the certain asset classes and said, hey, here's our vision. We'll bring in the right teams. We'll go bring in the capital. Uh, we just need you to execute within this time frame. And one of those projects is involved in, in, in self-storage, you said? It is. So my, my business partner, Janine Blake, has a uh, very unique background. Um, her family started pods, portable on-demand storage, uh, which I'm sure most of your listeners have heard of. And Janine was instrumental uh, in really growing what I would say was, you know, 70% of that business. Uh, she was in charge of franchising. Um, so in the self-storage fund, we're really looking at those tertiary markets or, you know, even third-tier markets and going in and, and taking some of their older self-storage facilities, cleaning them up so they don't just look like dump yards out there, making them, you know, presentable and clean, uh, having a nice place for individuals to, to store everything they need, as well as a couple new builds that we'll take on. Well, you should come out to Vegas. There's a, there's a huge demand for self-storage here, that's for sure. People moving in and out of this town like you wouldn't believe. <laughs> yeah, I, I, don't, I don't want to give away any secrets, but uh, I will say we've, we've been looking, believe me. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's okay. good. And, love people to come to Vegas because then they gamble more and then that's to our benefit. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. Right. They want to keep the money in their pockets though. So, you know, we, we want them to buy homes and, and run businesses as well. <laughs> Which they do as well. Absolutely. You know, Vegas is a normal town and people who live in Vegas very rarely go down to the strip where all, where all the tourists come. They just stay in their own regular, normal, everyday place in, in Vegas. Right. And, 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 now, and how, do, how, do you, how do you, are you guys looking to market the, your, your fund? Are you doing any advertising? Are you going to any events? or how, how are you getting the word out for that? Or is it too early at this point still? No, that, that's a great question. So we do a lot of educational seminars regarding the opportunity zones in general, uh, really just to um, 
keep the investors, the local real estate uh, brokers and agents, um, you know, up to date with everything that's going on. And by doing that, we've attracted a lot of attention and investors. Um, and then we also visit a lot of uh, family office events. And, you know, we go in and we'll, we'll talk to the local family offices, uh, most of them in the southeast, and say, hey, this is what we've got on the, uh, on the horizon. Um, you know, and a lot of them haven't really jumped into the opportunity zones yet. But that's, that's really the, the perfect demographic. You're talking about patient long-term capital that's looking for, you know, multi-generational wealth planning. You know, who, who better to talk to than those families that are planning for 20, 30, 40 years out? Yeah, no question. I mean, those, that is uh, the sweet spot in terms of, of marketing. Uh, but I'm, I'm wondering how many of those people know enough about Opportunity Zones right now to really attend these conferences, per se, or uh, you know, like we, we started the podcast off, you know, they, they may just read an article about it. And, uh, you know, are they, are they um, interested enough to maybe pick up the phone and, and, and call at this point? And if not, well, what, do you, what do you have to do to get that person to, to say, yeah, you know, call me because I think this might be good for you? Great question. So a, a lot of a lot of personal outreach, um, you know, really do really do your due diligence and research on on the families that you're going to be approaching. You know, don't don't go approach a, uh, you know, a, a venture tech family office and say, hey, I've got this great multifamily project for you in the opportunity yeah, zone. Yeah. You know, they're, they're going to look at you sideways. Um, so no different than doing your due diligence on a project, you really have to do due diligence on, on the families and investors that you're approaching um, and see if the opportunity zones are, are even on their radar at all. And then from there, once, you, you know, once you've seen, okay, this, this family office loves storage, this family office loves the hotel space, then you can go out, introduce yourself, build a good relationship, and then on your second or third visit say, okay, here's the projects that we've had laid out, any interest in your family you know, coming in and, and making that investment. That's how we've been going about it. That's smart because I'll tell you, there's, uh, you know, there's, there's so many ways to look into this program, and it sounds to me like you have to do the due diligence on both ends. Everyone has to do their due diligence, both the developer, the uh, you know, real estate people, the investor. Every, everyone's got work to do before they, they dive into something like this. Absolutely. And, you know, this program is amazing, but – you know, I caution people, it, it is not a walk in the park. It is not as simple as just saying, hey, I'm going to open a, you know, qualified opportunity fund or, hey, I'm just going to put my money in this project. You've, you've got to do some serious legwork. Um, and for the individuals that aren't willing to do that, I would say, you know, keep, keep your money in your pocket. You know, don't, don't go into a project blind or start a fund blind and spend a lot of money on entity structure and marketing, you know, only to have that project not be funded due to your lack of due diligence. Exactly. And aside from the uh, end user, do you market to the professionals involved? Because if you don't have a good attorney who knows what they're doing with opportunity zones or a CPA or uh, a developer or real estate developer, you're going to be stuck because, as you say, there's a lot more to it and a lot of details to putting the fund together, finding the project, and then starting and completing it. No doubt about it. And, you know, I will say we're, we're extremely blessed and lucky to, to be in the area that we're in because we have all of those resources available to us. Um, you know, we have great attorneys at, you know, Foley and Lardner, Buchanan, you know, Hill Ward and Henderson, some of these bigger firms that have jumped in and said, okay, you know, we'll, you know, we'll lead the charge here. Um, and the same thing on the accounting side uh, with CLA, uh, you know, Clifton Larson Allen, who now goes by uh, CLA. We've got a great team of um, XPWC accountants that runs a group here uh, called Hollywell that helps with the underwriting and the compliance. So, We've, we've done a great job of partnering up with those teams as, as well as the banking solutions, right? At the end of the day, this is still a fund, uh, you know, so some really good relationships at J.P. Morgan uh, that uh, have really helped us along the way as far as uh, getting banking ready to go for the funds uh, and lending as well. You know, as, as we all know, leverage in real estate is, is extremely important. That's true. Do you have a dollar amount on that fund that you're looking to raise? So 
for the Central Florida redevelopment, we'll be looking at a little north of about 110 million. And for our self storage fund, a little north of 20 to 25 million. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. great. Well, the self storage idea, I really like a lot because obviously it's a, it's a great business and it's just a matter of finding a place that it, it, it makes sense in. So you, right. you, you, you hit the nail on the head on that one for sure. So I, I commend you on that one. And I mean, it sounds like you are, you're practicing what you're preaching in the terms of the due diligence and you guys are doing a lot of work on your end and making sure everything works out and penciling out. So that is really, if you have a takeaway from this podcast, I think that's what it is. It's, it's just things aren't as easy as they look, and you really have to work at it to be successful on just about every single level. Absolutely. And, you know, we have a partner. Uh, his name is Dave, Dave Silliman from Easy Do It, who works on uh, Opportunity Zones, and they're putting together an event in December in Florida, Virginia Beach, and and. It's a, a unique event in that it's only for investors and fund owners to come together and create relationships, find investors, and investors finding funds that are available to put their money in. And you might be interested in, in going there and seeing what you can find. Yeah, we, we would definitely love to be a part of that. Um, and actually, thank you for saying that. It, it actually just sparked uh, a reminder. November 7th here locally, we're doing a, uh, a little private event for some local investors uh, regarding education in the Opportunity Zone space. Um, not really marketing the funds. As we all know, we still have to play by the SEC's rules, uh, you know, when we're out here. Um, but really just bringing somewhere between 75 and 100 families, um, not, not just from Florida, but a couple of uh, – you know, nationwide families together to say, hey, this is what the Opportunity Zones are all about. Go ahead and ask us any questions you have. So thank you for jogging my memory. <laughs> yes. Um, is, is there a, some kind of a registration link online to attend that, that event? Th that one is invitation only, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, yeah. So it sounds like that other event uh, makes a lot more sense for uh, everyone else. Yeah, listening. yeah. Yeah, yeah usually and, we'll, we'll, and, we'll, and what's nice about this one, I'm sure it's educational as well, but their keynote speakers are Ben Carson and Scott uh, Turner, which who are very active, as you know. They're the, the managers and creators of the whole uh, Opportunity Zone program. So getting to hear them speak and meeting them as well gives you a great opportunity for networking. Definitely. And, and anyone who hasn't had a chance to hear uh, Dr. Ben Carson speak, uh, they should do so. He was at the Southeast region event that we were at the last couple of days. Uh, and he's obviously a, a brilliant gentleman. So I would, uh, ah. I would tell anyone who hasn't had the chance to listen to get out there and, uh, you know, take advantage of that. And same with Scott Turner. He's fabulous. He he just really is an advocate for Opportunity Zones and knows so much. He's the executive director of the program. So uh, yep. it's it's nice to hear from the people who are wor running and working the program as well so that you know what are the plans for the future, what's going to happen after, you know, in 10 years, what's going to happen after December 31st, 2019, how is the program going to go forward? And it's nice, and, and they get your input so they know how to deal with the rules and regulations of the whole program and the funds to be able to modify them and make them easier and user-friendly and more workable as well. So these are great opportunities, these events like you're putting on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and Edmund, if anyone's listening to this podcast right now and has questions or needs to contact you, what's the best way that they, get, they can reach you? Definitely. So they can jump onto our website at opzoneconsulting.com, and they can also reach out to uh, myself or my business partner, Janine, uh, via email, and that's edmon, E-D-M-O-N, at opzoneconsulting, O-P-P-Z-O-N-E-C-O-N-S-U-L-T-I-N-G.com, and Janine's is uh, the same. It would be janine at opzoneconsulting.com. And, you know, they can feel free to give us a call, shoot us an email. Uh, all of our contact information is online, and we'd, we'd be happy to answer any questions they have. 
Great, great. We'll, we'll, link, we'll make those linkable on the show notes as well so people could just contact you easily that way. But, uh, yeah, this was a really interesting podcast. You guys are doing some great work. Vicki, do you have any last question for Edmund or before we close this out? Um, uh, Edmund, I would ask you, what, what would be your um, hope for the future of Opportunity Zones? I would say my, my biggest hope, Vicki, would be a shift more towards the business aspect of the Opportunity Zone program. Uh, as we all know, doing the real estate side is a little bit easier. Uh, I, I don't want to downplay it and say that it's easy, um, but truly reaching out to the communities and finding good business owners or, uh, you know, running incubators or even, you know, venture capital type funds in the space so that we don't only get the growth on the real estate side, but we really see great founders and good business ideas, you know, funded and supported through this program. Do you think that um, blockchain or tokenization has any uh, impact or in the future for Opportunity Zone um, capitalization? Um, to be honest with you, I am not an expert in that space, uh, so really don't have uh, much of a comment on it. But just with the amount of attention that it's getting, I would be surprised if it didn't have some part in the program. Yeah, well, to issuing tokens for a business to issue tokens to raise capital is very lucrative and much easier than uh, doing an IPO issuing stock and an easier way to um, generate income for a business to be able to in, um, work in an opportunity zone. So long as you don't commingle your funds, you can put capital gains funds and uh, alternate income and work together to make your project easier to, to complete, more successful. That sounds like a, a, a topic we could do a whole podcast on, actually. Well, that's there you right. go. That's a huge. <laughs> but, uh, but, <laughs> we'll let you become more educated before we talk about it, Edmund. Right. I'll yeah, start coding it, tomorrow. There yeah. you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's great. Uh, so, okay, listen, Edmund, thank you so much for being a, a guest on today's show. We really appreciate you taking the time out to speak to us with our audience and, and providing us with this information today. Uh, uh, great stuff. We're really, really happy to have you on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it. Outstanding okay. podcast. Thanks, Edmund. Yeah, and thank You're you, welcome. Vicky, you. for co-hosting. Let's, uh, let's, let's close this show out. And we want to just tell everyone out there that you're listening to the Mappable USA podcast at mappableusa.com, where we put you on the map. We're out there all the time trying to get great guests like Edmund. If you'd like to be a guest on, on the show like Edmund was, you can go to our website. There's a guest tab there. Fill it out, and we'll see what we can do about getting you on the show. You can scroll down our homepage to see all the syndication sources. You pick the one that you like best so you never miss another Mappable USA episode. So thanks, everyone, for listening. Thanks for your, your support, and we'll be at you next week with another Mappable USA podcast. Thanks, everyone. Have a great week. 